So welcome everyone. Thank you for joining us for our Friends Council workshop on uh, policy and practice, leading the way in supporting transgender and non-binary students in independent schools. I don't know if you can see me back here. I'll try to, it's hard to find a spot where I can see all of you. Uh, we'd like to start with just a moment of settling silence in the manner of friends. Thank you. I'm going to keep it really short because we have a lot to cover in a short period of time. My name is Betsy Torg. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I work at Friends Council on Education, and we are the coordinating and hosting uh, association for this workshop. And uh, to give a little sense of, hang on, Oop. a little bit about Friends Council. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, we are the National Association of 78 Quaker Schools in 22 states. Uh, we have a large cluster. About half of our schools are right in Philadelphia. Uh, that is not by accident. That is where the first Quaker school was founded uh, over 325 years ago by William Penn. We have schools all the way up and down the East Coast, as far north as Portland, Maine, and as far south as right here in Georgia. We have Friends School Atlanta that is just 20 minutes from here. We have a cluster of schools in the Midwest and also schools on the West Coast. Uh, Friends Council's mission is to nurture the Quaker character and essence of our schools, and we do that through professional development, uh, leadership support, and providing resources and best practices. So a little bit about Quaker education. This is gonna be a super speedy crash course. We could do a whole workshop on this, but just for those who may not be familiar, uh, our Quaker schools vary in size and in geography, as we just saw. Uh, they also vary in terms of their community, which is standard for lots of schools. However, we share uh, core values that we work to live into, and that unites us as we deliver education to young people. Uh, we are guided by the Quaker values, also known as the testimonies, and that they are simplicity, peace, integrity, community, equality, and stewardship. Our schools are very student-centered, and we focus on uh, respect and appreciation for differences. Our schools work hard to uh, be very committed to social justice and equity work, and we actively look to uh, protect those who are most vulnerable. So if you're thinking like, why are we here? Why Quaker schools in this particular topic? I think that sets the stage a little bit and you can see uh, why we're um, looking at this particular topic. One of our strategic initiatives is to develop programs and partnerships that address equity and, and justice. And so over the past couple of years, we've had a number of schools calling us and reaching out to us for support and resources. And we've been doing our best to provide that for them. Uh, and in the process of that, I've had the opportunity to speak with our panelists that are here today. And there's a great depth of knowledge and experience uh, in this group of fantastic friend school educators. And so we look to pull them together and share their learning and their experience with all of you. So to start in, in honoring our student-centeredness, uh, we are also here for the students, and I'd like to read this quote that came from a trans student. This came from a, a research project that Rachel Kane did. Uh, so this is a quote from a trans student. Letting the students know that at least there are faculty members that are by their side, giving options for the bathroom and locker room, making sure other kids aren't giving them a hard time, and really listening to what the student is saying and what pace they want everything to happen. Whoops, sorry about that. It suddenly started going backwards. My apologies. So, without further ado, I'm really excited to have you meet our panelists. We have four educators from four different friend schools. Uh, these four have a tremendous amount of experience and expertise in supporting trans students between the four of them, and I think you're really in for a great session learning for them, from them. So without further ado, each panelist will introduce themselves, and then we'll move into the meat of our program. Good afternoon. 
Uh, my name is Maria Alonzo, and I'm upper school psychologist at West Town School, which is a Quaker school, uh, pre-K through 12 day and boarding in Westchester, Pennsylvania. Hi, my name is Edna Valdepenas. So I work at George School, uh, which is a boarding school, uh, high school, also located outside of Philadelphia. Um, I currently teach English, and I use she, her, her pronouns. I'm Rachel Kane, and I'm at Sidwell Friends School, which is a day school, PK through 12th grade in Washington, D.C., and I use she, her, hers pronouns. Greetings, friends. Uh, my name is Jason Craig Harris. I use he, him, his pronouns. I'm at Friends Seminary, which is in New York City, and right in the heart of New York City, which is Manhattan, uh, K through 12 schools, 770 students. I serve as the school's Director of Diversity and Inclusion, as well as the co-chair of our Center for Peace, Equity, and Justice. Great, thanks everyone. We're now gonna move into uh, the heart of our program. Uh, before we do that, just so we know who's in the room, uh, so that we can tailor our comments accordingly. How many folks here are from a K through 12 independent school? Okay, anybody who that's just from an elementary ed school? K through six, K through eight? Okay, and just uh, boarding, uh, any boarding schools? Two, three, okay. And the rest are all day schools. Okay, great, thanks. We're gonna assume, we're assuming actually that most of you have some um, basic knowledge and a familiarity with the vocabulary. We don't have time to do a gender 101. Uh, if, if you're in a place where this is not quite um, at your level, please talk to us afterwards and we're happy to provide you with resources and direction about how you can do that in your school. So the first part of our program is going to be about uh, policy. We know you're going to have questions. There's a lot this is complicated and there's a lot to it. We'd ask that you hold your questions to the end. We are leaving time for that at the end. So the, we're gonna start off with policy and policy development. And again, since Friends Schools are very student-centered, we'd like to uh, lead off with a quote from a transgender non-binary student. I think it is important for all students to feel supported in expressing their gender identities and having a statement slash policy is a big part of that. So we're gonna hear from each of our panelists uh, about this area, and they'll be addressing what was the process for writing your school's policy, and what models did you use? We're gonna start with Edna from George School. Hi, uh, I mentioned in the introductions that I currently teach English at George School, but in terms of our policy development, um, when we first started the process, I was a dean of students, or I worked in the dean's office, and I was also the director of diversity and inclusion. And I was uh, appointed the assistant clerk of the task force uh, that eventually developed in the policy. Um, so as I mentioned, George School is a, is a boarding school. And as far back as at least 2005, uh, we've had students who identify as trans or binary. Um, and we were able to support those students in their process, even though we didn't have a policy. Um, and then in the fall of 2014, a, stu a student uh, who was a current student wanted, uh, knew that they wanted to come out and was looking for the structure of a school policy to be able to do so. Um, so in addition to all of the, the, what was going on in the media and what was going on nationally uh, in terms of uh, gender identity, um, our school really wanted to get behind uh, or get in front of actually uh, this whole process and make sure that we had a, process, had a policy in place at our school. Um, so the task force was formed that fall of 2014 uh, over the course of four or five months, we did research, we communicated with other independent schools, um, and ultimately crafted a policy that was approved by the board in the spring of 2015. So at um, West Town School, we completed the, the policy by the summer of 2015, um, in some ways a similar process to, to the George School. Um, our students' needs really drove the creation of the policy. Um, uh, as students were beginning to come out and needing the supports um, and the changes in, in structures, uh, we, we were met with the responsibility to respond uh, with the creation of a policy. And so uh, we actually looked to the George School, was one of the policies we looked at, and we also used the GLSEN model uh, as well. Uh, and our head of school at the time uh, was um, able to bring really all the stakeholders, um, and so parents, students, administrators, faculty, um, health professionals, um, all 
had a part in, in the creation of the, the policy. Um, and so the learning from creating the policy, I think, was you know, that we needed to move from being reactive to equipped and, and proactive. So it was a very important time for us. So when I was getting to Sidwell Friends School a couple of years ago, it happened that um, the spring before that, they had already been in the process of uh, developing a policy to support transgender and non-binary students. The main place that they were looking as a model was GLSEN, which is the Gay, Lesbian, Straight Educators Network and has a lot of resources for schools and educators. Um, what was great about that policy is that it happened to correspond with a time when we had our first middle school student who was coming out as transgender. And so as that student's family was starting to ask questions, um, not unlike what Maria just said, we were able to actually refer to a policy that we had already developed rather than having to develop one. I will say that I've also been at a school where we did not have a policy and we did have out transgender students and there were very good practices in place even without policy. And so so it's just to say that even if you're at a school that is not yet sure about developing a policy or doesn't yet have one, it doesn't mean that you can't do a really good job supporting your trans and non-binary students. At Friends Seminary, um, as early as 2014, we had students who were beginning to identify as non-binary or trans, um, and so they too drove the conversation for thinking about how to create a community that's attentive to gender and inclusive and expansive ways. Uh, and so in our attempt to support those students, we began to have intensive conversations, which led to the drafting of a kind of internal guidance on how you support transitioning students at a school. I mean, what do you do? How, how do they come out to their class, and what do you do with the admissions forms? All of those kind of pieces we were able to cover um, in that internal guidance. And that then eventually led to uh, community letters that were sent out to the community um, authored by our head of school and, and me, and they were sort of position statements. You know, here is the school's position on gender and sexuality diversity across the developmental sequence, K through 12. Um, that then eventually led to our um, expanding our current non-discrimination and inclusive practices statement to include a gender identity and gender expression, which it had not before. And now we're in a position where we're thinking quite critically about crafting a specific policy around overnight trips and gender inclusive practices. Um, because again, that's a, a place, unfortunately, where gender is oftentimes inscribed rather than chosen. Um, we also, and you'll hear a bit about this a little bit later, but we, um, this whole conversation really began with thinking about facilities in critical ways. Like, do I, when, I, when, I, when, I use the, when I wanna use the restroom, do I have to gender myself? What does that mean? What does that look like? So that's a part of this piece as well. Great, thank you. So that's our very quick overview for policy. And again, I'm sure everybody will have questions and we can circle back to specific policy development related questions. We're gonna move into the section of our program that is about best practices in our schools. And uh, I believe this is Rachel and Maria who will take us through this part. So one of the things that's been great about preparing for this panel is actually realizing that there are so many schools thinking about this and that we have so much to learn from each other. And I just wanted to express my gratitude before jumping in here. Um, one of the things that we're well aware of is that even at schools, um, you know, who are not sure whether they do or don't have trans students, the likelihood is that you may, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, so because of that, uh, one of our students when surveyed last year said schools can help by providing a safe space and equal opportunities, as well as supporting the gender nonconforming students. Um, and so, you know, to the point about assuming that you have trans community members, um, some of our schools have had experiences with students who have actively come out. They've actively said, you know, we were born, we were sexed, you know, I, I was born with these parts, told I was male or female, and I, I identify in this other way, right? Um, and you may have students who are in some form or some stage of transition who either they are thinking that maybe they're identifying as non-binary or trans but haven't yet come out. 
You may have a student who's joining your community after they've already gone through the transition process and they don't have any obligation to tell you that. And so it may be that a student who enrolls in your school is going through their entire school career and you know them as a boy and it turns out at some point somebody else knew them as a girl. Um, and so rather than wait until someone is coming out, one of the best practices can be just to assume that someone in your community or some people in your community are already identifying as trans. So thinking about school forms and documents is a pretty, it's pretty wide in scope. Um, I've worked with uh, admissions, the school office, advisors, faculty staff, the database folks. Um, and so it's important to think about what's the information that we're capturing, who gives it to us, and what do we do with it? Um, so thinking about sort of the, a lot of the back end work um, that goes on in schools. Um, and at George School, we've always had a way for students to identify and go by their preferred name. So in terms of roll sheets and the database, that was not a difficult piece to address. Um, but it's also important to consider other documents, all the way from the inquiry form to roll sheets, end of term reports, uh, letters of recommendation, diploma, transcripts. Um, and at George School, we've changed the way we ask for information, even at the very initial inquiry stage. Um, so for example, on the inquiry form on the website, um, it now includes non-binary as an option for gender. Um, so I mean, that's just one of the ways that we've been able to implement um, implement our policy. Um, and for example, even the way we take role for meeting for worship, it used to be by gender. Um, and now we take role, I mean, it was a pretty simple shift, but one that really spoke to uh, the policy and really supporting students. So now we take role by last name instead of gender. Um, so it was clear as we were proceeding following the adoption of our policy that the way we were going to implement it hits on lots of different elements of the school that really has far-reaching implications. So a, a part of um, supporting our uh, gender non-conforming students is in the use of pronouns. Um, and so some of our best practices, uh, actually in our middle school, I understand that now we, um, when we're interviewing and speaking to parents, we ask for um, the child's uh, preferred pronoun use. Um, in the upper school, uh, we, during the beginning of, of school and orientation, our students um, have name tags, but also in each class are asked to um, identify with uh, the, pr the pr pronouns that they would like, that they would prefer. Uh, faculty as well. Uh, and I know that it's something that mistakes can be made, uh, but I know that in best practice, as long as we step up and we um, you know, are, are able to um, own it, I think students can be very forgiving. Um, our dean also has a practice of sending out, with the permission of the student, uh, their preferred pronouns to faculty to make sure, again, that we honor uh, what they are, they are asking for. Um, Probably one of the first questions that will come up for a student who is transitioning um, may be around facilities, and that may look a little bit different in day schools versus boarding schools. So we're going to talk a little bit about both of those settings. Um, in a day school, as well as a boarding school, certainly bathrooms and locker rooms are um, places that will come up for a student. Um, one of the things that, at least in the um, schools that I've been in where we've had students who are transitioning, that has been really important has been uh, to listen to those students, um, to remember that our job is to keep students safe, and safe is different than comfortable, and so sometimes there may be discomfort from um, other students if someone is transitioning and maybe starting to use a new space and that we have language around that um, in how we support everyone but also that sometimes a third space is actually really necessary I think sometimes a student um, may identify as non-binary but may not be ready for example I've had a student who you know started their school career identifying as a girl um, was raised as a girl and then um, came to the realization, actually, you know what, I'm, I'm a boy and I've been living in a way that is not authentic. 
Um, but it didn't mean that that student was immediately ready to be going into a boy's locker room. It didn't mean that that student was immediately ready to be using a boy's bathroom. It did mean that the student was no longer comfortable using a girl's locker room or a girl's bathroom. And so um, not in all schools, but in many schools, there may be sort of single-use bathrooms or other bathrooms that can be considered for all gender bathrooms. Um, we went back and forth about gender neutral versus all gender and, and stuck with all gender for a variety of reasons. Um, and it really met the student's need because it didn't Usually best practice is that we do not force a student to be in a space that doesn't correspond with their identity. It doesn't necessarily mean that they're immediately ready to be in a new space, and we sort of follow that student's lead. Um, and sometimes, you know, a lot of times those, those may be spaces that have traditionally been labeled as adult-only bathrooms, for example. And I think, uh, you know, we're lucky enough as educators to hopefully always want what's best for kids and be able to say, like, is the privilege of having a private space to pee for adults, like, going to overwhelm or outweigh the need for a student to feel comfortable and, and not frankly put themselves in a medical situation where they're holding things all day because they don't have a space to actually relieve themselves. That's a pretty basic need that we need to meet as schools. So um, at West Town, it was interesting because it's, um, uh, it's a 200 year old, over 200 years old, but we're, our structure is actually rather binary. Um, and so it was quite challenging because it's been traditionally boys end and girls end. Um, and clearly we were, that was not supportive of, um, you know, our students that were identifying as non-binary and trans. And so we have tried to make changes like East End and West End. It's coming along, um, but it's, a ch it's, you know, it takes time and we have to be um, patient. Uh, in terms of dorms, uh, we actually now are, where it used to be a boys' bathroom, you know, girls' bathroom, now it's residence uh, restroom. And so we're, we're really trying to pay attention. Um, actually, going down to the, in the main building, we had, again, bathrooms that were gendered. Um, and as of this year, we were able to um, create um, gender neutral bathrooms, which was, again, a major advance, so little by little. Um, and uh, in terms of what you had said about locker rooms, um, again, our, our students, depending on uh, w w how they identify, um, you know, we have uh, spaces where they can go and um, that's uh, gender neutral um, and, again, supportive. Um, and I was going to add one thing, and then I know uh, Jason also something, has something to add. Sometimes I think it feels like, do we have to build like a third space? Do we have to do all this construction? What's that going to cost? And one thing to also consider is retrofitting bathrooms that do exist, even with just um, stalls around everything, so that whether it's a boy's room, a girl's room, a women's room, a men's room, that rather than having sort of anywhere that's open, that you put stalls around everything so that there is privacy regardless of who's doing what in those spaces. Um, Friends Seminary happens to be in a renovation project right now, and so um, we've been in constant conversation with students about uh, what would feel comfortable. You know, we're gonna ha we have uh, single stall gender inclusive restrooms, but students said, listen, what we really want, what's really gonna help is if we had, similarly to your point, a multi-stalled um, gender inclusive restroom with an open wash area, and so we're, we're building it right now. Um, I have the architectural plans. If you were to give me your email address afterwards, I can email them to you. But it really, it's, it's a profound thing. And I think that students feel, um, will, and from what they've shared with me, would feel so much more comfortable being able to use the restroom without having a restroom politicized. I'm just gonna step in with a time update. We have about seven minutes left for this piece just to keep everybody on track. Okay, thanks. So um, it, I'll just go through quickly that, you know, it's really important for schools to know if the athletic league that you belong to has some policy. Um, and we have, as an example, um, this page here from the Friends School League to which both West Town and George School, um, we, we participate in league contests um, in this particular league. And we put this up here as an example. This policy was, uh, was posted in, or was finalized in 2016 and after George School had a policy. What's interesting is that the Friends School League, it's comprised primarily by Friends Schools, but not entirely. So um, 
if your if your athletic league, for example, has a policy, that's the body that determines the league competition guidelines, not necessarily the individual schools. Um, so it's really going to be important to know if your if your league has has a policy or not. So uh, one of the things also that may come up for your school is uh, do you take overnight field trips? And what does that look like if you have a student who is transgender or non-binary? Um, so I am not sure that I clarify that I'm a middle school principal and so the students that I've worked with have been in middle school and in both uh, cases they have been students who have been near the beginning of the coming out process. Um, and so in the instances in the middle school where we have uh, uh, ended up is that we've taken the lead from students. And so we've said to the student, you know, we're going to take an overnight trip. Um, usually we would, as teachers, I think we say, you're not going to know your roommate till you get there, right? Because you don't want them to be like figuring it out and you want to have some control over it. But in the case of a transgender student who's like very new in the process and who is feeling somewhat vulnerable, we decided to ask that student, you know, do you have people you'd feel more comfortable rooming with? Um, and so the student named a few people. We also then said, would you like those people to know in advance? Is that important to you? In our student's case, it was important. That student being a middle schooler, it's always hard to know, am I gonna be accepted or about anything? And they, they wanted to know that it was gonna be comfortable to anyone in the room. And so we just took their lead and we asked the other students who were comfortable. Um, you know, students tend to know each other. They know who their allies are. They know who they have decided to tell first. And um, rather than our just randomly putting them with people, we opted to ask the question. Uh, just a, a quick little note on the overnight trip piece. You know, we at Friends Seminary are thinking about um, and actually in the process of drafting a policy around um, ensuring that all of our students get to room with folks who make them feel comfortable. Um, and so that looks in different sort of ways. You know, one of course is to always include student voice in um, overnight experiences and lodging so that you're not assigning students but that you're inviting them to identify people um, who they feel comfortable around. That's sort of the first step. Um, the next piece, of course, is um, the possibility for students to opt out of traditional gendered arrangements in the first place. And so um, we at Friends right now have begun this process of um, you know, having students on a case-by-case -case basis say we prefer to be in a kind of gender-inclusive room. Let's work with our parents and you all to make that possible. So that's a, sort of an, a next step. But I think the step beyond that, which is a step of aspiration for us that we're working toward, is the idea of, from the very beginning, offering multiple options for students um, for rooming so that um, you always have, you know, perhaps a traditionally um, women-gendered space or men-gendered space, but you also then have a gender-inclusive space as well. And so we, if you want, we can talk more about that during the Q&A, but I think that's the direction um, that many of our schools are moving in. A question that often comes up is, so does that mean I can never like use the term boys or use the term girls or can I never have like a class meeting where just the girls are invited or just the boys are invited? And best practices indicate that it isn't that you can never be meeting in those groups, but rather it, what is the intentionality behind it? And so if you're just looking to sort of arbitrarily group, and I love the example of taking role at meeting for worship, there's a lot of other ways to do that. Um, and you know, sometimes there's a girl dynamic that's going on in the seventh grade class and you actually need a meeting with the girls in the seventh grade class. Um, and provided anybody who's identifying as a girl in the seventh grade class is welcome at that meeting, it absolutely is an okay thing to be doing and there's intention behind that. So it's not about never meeting in groups where gender is part of that. And in fact, affinity groups may be a, an absolute reason to be meeting in by gender, um, but rather, is it intentional and is everyone who identifies in that way invited into the space? So 
So in terms of um, school photos and yearbook photos, um, you wouldn't believe it, but there's a lot of gendered language um, in that. And so uh, actually our dean of students um, worked with the uh, person who was doing our senior portraits to change a lot of the gendered so language. And it's so it's something to look at and to be mindful of. And the other one is on yearbooks. Oftentimes, you know, students have a page. Um, and on that page, sometimes they're asked to put baby pictures or pictures when they were young, and that can be very, very stressful. So again, a best practice is to begin thinking about what are those instructions for that for that uh, yearbook page. And I just want to say a word about um, attire and graduation um, and proms and those kinds of things. So best practice is really um, uh, suggest not to dictate to people what they should wear on the grounds of a gender or perceived gender. Um, that really, um, we are all about autonomy and agency, of course, appropriateness, but we should probably query that too, actually. Um, but we, but we, we really support the idea that students should be able to dress in ways that affirm who they are. I want to say a word about curriculum as well. Um, just that uh, one of the pieces that's so critical um, is that as we're thinking about the gender revolution and trying to expand how we represent all of humanity, um, that it behooves us to think critically about who we represent in our curriculum and who we don't. Uh, I mean, I think about uh, kindergarten, first, second, third grade, going into a, a classroom, being really excited, seeing all of these wonderful picture books around, and not seeing anyone who represents you, particularly if you identify as non-binary. Um, uh, and so the value of being able to actually showcase in the physical, architectural, aesthetic landscape of the space, being able to represent a variety of human bodies that, that some perhaps can be clearly gendered, quote unquote, and some that can't be. Um, it's so important that students have an opportunity to see themselves. And so here I'm thinking about a windows and mirrors approach, right? If you are a student who's playing with gender, you might want to see some students who are playing with gender, and you might want to see some characters who are playing with gender. If you um, are someone who's not playing with gender as much, you should still be able, through literature um, and through the folks that you're able to access ocularly, you should still be able to see into those worlds and those experiences. So visibility is critical, um, and visibility has everything to do with building positive self-esteem from day one. Just a friendly quick update. We have about 20 minutes left before we move into Q&A, just so you can all time yourselves. We're going to move into uh, the purpose of community education. And again, to lift up a student voice, um, this came from a transgender non-binary student from Rachel's research. To make students feel supported, we should focus on educating the staff, parents, and students about gender diversity slash identity and make sure that students feel safe and cared for. Jason's gonna lead us off with this. So in thinking about community education, what we're really thinking about is education that is preventative, right? And by that I mean, uh, so oftentimes we're caught into this situation where uh, some sort of transphobic microaggression happens on campus and it offends folks and then we rush in to try to fix it. But what if we started with the idea that we could actually prevent those microaggressions from happening in the first place by creating an anti-microaggressive culture through education, um, ensuring that individuals who um, are not trans also recognize that gender and sexuality diversity education actually applies to all of us. We all need this critical cultural competency in order to be globally to be global citizens um, who have the resources and the skills to navigate the world. So the question for us is how to create communities where trans and non-binary youth thrive. Well, you do that by getting in at the cultural level, at the DNA level of the institution, which has everything to do with education, right? And the idea, it's a proactive education, and it's an education that is all-inclusive. It includes all the critical constituencies of the school. If you are working with children, if you're in the school building interacting with children, if you're a student interacting with other students, then you need to be a part of this educational experience, right, where you're going to be getting the information you need so that you too can promote uh, gender inclusivity. Um, so that includes education for trustees, the very top level of a school leadership structure. Um, that includes making sure that the administrators are also um, having a basic uh, literacy, basic vocabulary development around trans inclusivity and gender inclusivity. Um, so 
I'd like to think that education, to some degree, is a kind of inoculation against transphobia and gender bias. If we get the education down, we're going to be doing a, a lot of the work um, in advance of having to do sort of the triage, um, which of course is inevitable, but we're trying to do less triage, right? And the last thing I would say on this front, which I think is really important, is that is that this a kind of education, this whole community education, has to be ongoing. Um, it is never um, appropriate for, uh, for us as educators to say that in any discipline we've arrived. You know, if you're a scientist, like, whoo, I did my science, I'm done. Like, I, I know all there is to know, right, about space and technology, we're good. If you're a mathematician, I, it's rare that I ever, I've never, I think I've ever heard a mathematician say, you know what, that math conference, I don't need to go ever again, I'm done, right? So it is, it's unacceptable in our fields of inquiry for us to assume that there's a point of arrival, right? And so therefore we need to adopt that same sort of framework for doing this kind of work, that there isn't a point of arrival, but there are meaningful benchmarks along the way. So there are no check boxes in this work. So um, in terms of communi community education for faculty and staff, one of the first pieces is really to provide new uh, staff and faculty with orientation, right? The, to be able to help them get on a sort of a even uh, playing field to understand um, you know, vocabulary, to understand what is gender identity. I mean, it's critical that you bring in new faculty and staff into that understanding. Um, sort of what Jason was saying also, um, you know, mandatory ongoing training for all faculty and staff. Um, and we can bring facilitators from the outside at West Town. We brought um, some local outside facilitators like uh, Dr. Jean Stanley and um, Dr. Aaron Cross from UPenn. Um, that doesn't preclude, though, that there can be internal facilitators as well. I know that our um, assistant head of uh, faculty and programming, also even on our faculty portal, um, has always some readings, you know, always keeping us um, abreast and, and teaching and learning. And when I was uh, in the dean's office and the director of diversity and inclusion, I frequently was, uh, no, I was the person who worked with the new faculty staff, did a lot of the orientations and trainings during faculty meetings, during staff meetings. So it doesn't always have to be outside, um, an outside consultant. It could also be a combination of someone from the outside as well as inside. And I would just add that it's, it's also important to encourage faculty and staff to use their professional development budgets to go deeper. Um, we can only do so much work on campus, but this kind of work is worthy of deeper exploration. So you know, inviting folks to use their budgets to go out and to go to conferences and workshops and take deep dives in this material. I'll also add that um, it's, it's important for grade level teams, you know, kindergarten team, first grade, ninth grade, twelfth grade, to be able to have protected time so that they can think about their curriculum and think about the ways in which that they are supporting gender inclusive practices and gender inclusive knowledge. So in recent years at George School, we've had an all summer or all school summer reading um, that we follow up through the year with assemblies and small discussion groups. Um, and we do this as part of our larger commitment to diversity and inclusion um, to understand and normalize vocabulary, in this case, specific to gender identity. Um, and this past year, actually, we offered three different texts that approach gender identity in three different ways. And so that really allowed community members to hear different voices um, to, and also to allow different approaches to understanding gender and, gen and gender identity. Um, and the small group uh, discussions were led by faculty and staff, so scaffolding that um, the education of the faculty and staff to then be able to facilitate the small group discussions with the students was, was I think, really empowering for our, for our faculty and staff. And just a couple last points on this, on this particular front. Um, you know, at Friends Seminary, we started to normalize, as we discussed earlier, um, the idea of pronouns, right? The idea that actually pronouns are something that we all have, they might be different, but we ought to normalize the experience of inviting folks to name their pronouns in an affirmative way. And so uh, we have faculty now who are trained to, at the beginning of every semester, they offer an opportunity for students and for themselves to name their pronouns 
nouns in the classroom space, which is a remarkable um, moment of um, appreciation and respect. I had a student one time, I did this exercise, and I said, okay, we're going to do our pronouns. And then I had a student scream just out loud. And of course, I was shocked. I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. I was like, is something going on? Should I run? You know? um, but what happened was that the student said, I've never been to class where somebody actually asked for my pronouns. And it was liberating for them. And it sort of shocked them and moved them deeply. Um, and with that has come the movement of pronoun exercises into an actual curriculum. So now in our English department, um, as the English department um, folks are you know, teaching pronouns and teaching the development of language, they're also teaching teaching um, uh, gender inclusive pronouns, gender neutral pronouns as a part of that. Language naturally evolves and here's one additional way that that happens. So as, um, as we move into community education and families, I just want to frame it that it's really important that we not assume because the child where the student is um, using pronouns um, differently than uh, what they were given at birth, or um, you know maybe even a different name, that the parents are at the same place in terms of awareness or, or understanding. So um, it's a good practice to always be checking in and not assume um, that they're in the, on the same uh, trajectory. Sometimes um, you know there are fam you know parents who are quite behind, some are there and some are even ahead, but it, it really, there's a range. So as an extension of my earlier comments about the all school reading that we've had, um, we've actually also invited parents and guardians to do the readings as well. And um, we've had follow-up small discussions um, with, with families. Um, we, facilitated by the head of school and very often a parent who sits on the diversity oversight committee. So to be able to address um, the text, to be able to come and have the vocabulary and uh, you know, discuss some of the different approaches I think is, is helpful in, in lots of different fora. And I would only add to that that it's, um, it's important that parents have protected time and space to be able to do some of this work as well. So that might look like divisional meetings for parents. It could also look like smaller grade level meetings for parents. Um, I can recall it, you know, when we had a sixth grade student uh, returning to school with a different sense of self, uh, we had to convene the sixth grade parents and say, let's come together and think together and so how do we support this student as well as all of our students. So that's a critical part of the process. So community education and students and the students' voices. Um, one of my favorite events at West Town is actually when we have assembly periods and we have um, students uh, and sometimes alum coming back and telling their stories. I think that's a wonderful way um, for connection and for empathy and for greater understanding. And so we have had um, students who uh, either identify as um, uh, you know, in the spectrum of, of um, gender or, or trans that have told their stories just about um, a couple months ago. Uh, we actually had alum who were, that when they were at West Town, had identified they were gay and now were trans uh, male. So, um, and they told their stories and you could just see in the body language of the students just listening, um, empathizing and understanding the process. Um, it, uh, it's, a, it's a very, very powerful tool. So one thing to be aware of is, um, you know, that how you might talk about gender and or sexuality even might be different from grade to grade and that developmentally things that an older student might understand just would be presented a little bit differently potentially to younger students. Um, the middle schools that I've worked in most recently have been fifth through eighth grade and so how we've done grade level workshops with a fifth grader and how we've done that um, for eighth graders have looked a little bit different. But in the end, we've had shared goals that students come away um, just having a sense of vocabulary and also um, what it might mean to be someone who's identifying as trans or non-binary. Um, one way that we have done that in some schools has included um, workshops around gender in general and not just focusing on, you know, transgender students or non-binary students, but rather gender expression um, and lots of other things related to gender because, uh, you know, whether a student is 
binary or non-binary, they do have a gender identity. And so helping students understand who they are as well as who other people may identify as is, is really important. Um, when we had a student come out as transgender in the middle of the year, rather than sending a letter introducing the student to, or reintroducing the student to the community, which was one consideration on the table, we decided with the family that rather we were going to do a workshop around gender. The student decided that um, he wanted to be part of the education, and so he decided what parts he wanted to own and kind of got up there and um, was the teacher for some of his classmates, and he wanted specifically to be with his homeroom for that, and so we arranged that so that while he was doing the teaching in that space, the same teaching was going on for other students in other spaces. And then when we did send home a letter to, to families, it wasn't about that student, it was about the workshop. And in that letter about all the things that we did during the workshop, there was just a statement that said, one of the reasons we do workshops like this is that we are, are a community that is comprised of many different people. And we included in the sentence, um, you know, we have people in our community who identify as cisgender, and we also have people in our community who identify as non-binary or transgender. And it sort of normalized it. And the hope was also that maybe we were not just helping that student, but potentially other people in the community who have not yet come out. And I'll just add that um, it can be incredibly important for individuals who do identify as member members of the LGBTQ plus community to have protected space. Um, I would prefer to call it brave spaces where individuals can gather and talk about their experiences and think together. Now, many of our schools have GSAs, you know, Gay Straight Alliance or Gender and Sexuality Alliances. And at Friends, what we found is that you know we had a GSA, it was popular, but um, the, it couldn't be a true alliance. Um, where advocacy work could happen between in individuals who identify themselves as members of the LGBT plus community and other individuals, right? Because um, the conversations usually geared sort of uh, kind of got framed around, I just want to talk about what I'm experiencing in school right now and like what it feels like. And so students said, listen, we need something to relieve the burden off of our alliance and advocacy groups. So we created identity groups. Some folks call them affinity groups. But we created spaces so that folks could do the personal work that they wanted to be able to do, but then they could go to the alliance space then to advocate um, and to create systems for change. So these spaces are, are super important, and it's also sort of in, in a related way important for our students to be able to sort of reach out beyond the bounds of the school community and to be able to connect with students um, outside of their own school community by going to conferences, um, whether they're gender conferences, sexuality conferences, um, you know, thinking about the uh, Student Diversity Leadership Conference, the Trans Wellness Conference, um, and including some of the other regional conferences like the Mid-Atlantic Diversity Conference, so that the kids can really feel connected in, in a way that, um, I don't know about your schools, but to a certain degree, our school is a fishbowl, and you know they really want to reach out to beyond what's familiar and what's known, so that they cannot feel alone. Um, and it's really important, I think. And well, it's been in my experience that something as simple as making the students aware that these opportunities exist communicates your commitment and also the institution's commitment to supporting students. Just one last piece on this front, which is that um, all throughout uh, what you've heard from us today, um, we've been trying to emphasize the idea of student agency, the idea of student involvement, student feedback. Um, and so, you know, one example of this structurally is at Friends, we created a task force um, with the head of school and a group of students who wanted to think about gender inclusivity and in facilities. It's the only reason, actually, that today we're able to say we're going we're gonna to build um, a multi-stalled gender inclusive restroom because we have the head of school in the same room with students wrestling together and thinking together. So um, any opportunity to, to structurally embed um, possibilities for student feedback and engagement is really, really critical. Thank you all so much. So much wonderful information and I hope people are finding it useful. Uh, we do have a conclusion slide here. We're just going to post this. We have about 10 minutes left. Uh, so instead of taking up the time um, going through our little bullet points of here for our conclusion, we'll just put them up here. And I think we'd like to open it up to Q&A now so uh, that you all have a chance to ask some questions and, and hear some responses from our panelists. Uh, just so you know, we, have, we also have some resources listed. 
and um, we may not get to those, but just know that they are on the app. Our, our presentation is loaded and you can find them there. And if you are an educator who is looking for sample policies, uh, we have a collection at Friends Council of sample policies from Friends Schools. Uh, so I've left some business cards on the table. Please feel free to reach out to me, and I'm happy to share samples with you so that you have models to work from. I think the gentleman in the back was the first person, and I'll need to repeat your question if you speak up, or I'll repeat your question for you. Yeah, so the question was about um, how do you respond to parents who may resist um, some of this? And actually, one of our resources, do you mind if I go to oh, that? Go, do you mind clicking do. it? So the very first resource here is called Schools in Transition. And if you're able to click it and open it up, um, they have a bunch of appendices. And one of the appendices is actually anticipating pushback questions. And there is language for responding. Um, and uh, when you bring that up, um, It'll anticipate, for example, like, well, why are you talking about this in a school? And there are, there's great language to respond to that. Um, you're right. I think that probably, at least I have not received pushback. I don't know if anyone on this panel has received active pushback. It looks like uh, Jason has and will speak to that. Um, but I think we do have, as a, one of the shared things that we have is a set of values that we can turn to and say, you know, this is why we do this, here's our set of values, this is in keeping with our set of values, and that's certainly something, at, at, at least at Quaker schools, that we turn to, but I'd love to, Jason. Sure. So in my neck of the woods, the kind of resistance I receive are, it's along the lines of, um, is this developmentally appropriate, right? That's the sort of language that's used. And, and my response, and I'd say this to parents and to faculty, is that, um, so students are already learning gender. Like, the world is teaching students gender, and, and all, all I'm saying is what we should be able to do is to be proactive in intervening in their gender socialization, which has already begun since they came out of the womb. Um, and that response has been remarkably well received. Um, folks are like, oh, that's right, yes, as they're walking down the street, they're looking at the billboards. I'm like, yes, that's gender socialization right there. So how, why don't we proactively work together to ensure the messages that students are receiving are better messages than the ones that they would receive otherwise? Great. Uh, Kimberly, I think you may have been next. Um, so I have a question about overnight schools, and one of the issues that we struggle with, um, I'm also at a friend school um, outside of Philadelphia, more so friend school, um, and we had struggled with um, whether or not you notify the parents of the roommates if you're dealing with a situation where you have a student who was assigned to a gender birth, they now identify or they call this a different way. And so what about the Sorry. <laughs> so the question was about uh, for overnights, do, what about the parents? And should there be information, should there not? Um, again, I've only worked with middle school students and uh, I did ask the family of the student who was in the process of transitioning what their preference was. They actually wanted other parents to know. Um, and they, I think, wanted, they wanted their child to be comfortable and they wanted other families to be comfortable, but, but that was their preference. I don't know if that would be everyone's preference. I think what's tricky is that um, for privacy's sake, outing someone um, is not best practice, uh, but it, you're right that it brings up interesting questions. I wonder if there are other, no, I, what other people do? I, I think similar, really the, the privacy piece is, is very important to us, and so um, uh, I think that, uh, you know, we, again, we, we allow the, the student um, to, to lead. Um, and it, it's really a great guide. The one other thing I would add that was interesting, at least with our student, is that um, you know there may be physiological components of the transition. And for our student, who was um, female to male, um, 
they were not yet on hormone blockers. And so one of the things we actually had to ask was, is there any chance you're gonna get your period um, while you are rooming with boys? And how are we gonna navigate it? And it was a really important question to ask because it turned out the answer was yes. Um, and so the other thing just to consider is that physiologically, what's going on for your student who is transitioning and are there still experiences that are going to have that are um, you know, remnants of their sex at birth and how do you make sure that if they're in spaces with other people who are not gonna have that experience that they can manage what they need to manage. I would just add um, that, you know, one of the things that it, it's best practices, in my opinion, is, you know, being able to let parents know in advance that this is how you're doing your rooms. And here's how, how I would suggest it. You know, I would say things like, you know, we are doing, are, we are, you know, arranging our rooms on the grounds of gender self-identification, right? So in advance, they are already aware that the landscape has changed, and so we're prioritizing gender identity. So you actually don't need to know, all you need to know is that they identify as a boy, or as a girl, or as non-binary. Additional questions, yeah, right here in the middle. So the, so the question had to do with uh, application and inquiry forms. Um, so the way our website currently reads for the inquiry form, um, the non-binary option actually, and you know, we've talked, and when I talked with admissions, I talked with the database people about if we have a text, if we have sort of other and text box or it, and so, yeah, it, so we went with non-binary and that, generates a conversation with admissions. And so we, uh, after we get uh, you know, that information, there's usually a follow-up conversation with admissions, like is there anything else you'd like us to know? And so from there, we again follow the student's lead. Um, and that assumes that the student clicks that if that's appropriate, and sometimes it might not even happen. So we may very well have students um, who identify as as male, click male, and that's all we know. Um, so it's interesting some of the, the concerns that come up as a result of when we think we know, when there are very often times we probably don't. And then this is our second part. Sure. Um, Yes, yeah. yes. All of the above. And I know that, yeah, and I, I know that I do that at the beginning of the school year. For example, I introduce myself to my classes, even though they probably already know me, um, and, I, and I include pronouns. Yep. In the back, in the pink sweater. So that's a great question. Um, that's been a process at, at, at our school, again, because 
again, 200 years old, a lot of very binary in its traditions. Um, and what I think what we've been doing is we've been listening to the student voices. And um, so uh, there, there are sometimes options. So we had, for, just as an example, a uh, quick one, uh, we would have junior caroling, which was all females, you know, singing around the dorms. And, you know, it used to be mandatory. Well, now it's optional. Um, so, so there's the, the option of, of, and then we had another example is we have kind of like morning, think about it as morning meeting, it's called collections, um, and it, there's boys collection, girls collection, now we have one that's um, for non-conforming. Um, and so it's, it's developing, I think, options beyond the binary um, is how we've proceeded. I mean, I, I, I think it's creating a space for our students to feel like I belong. Yeah. I think we have time for one last question right here, second row in the end. Jason, I'm wondering if you could go back to you mentioned the traditional beliefs and if you could speak a little bit more on the tone that you tended to strike. Thank you for that question. So the question was um, what could a position statement look like um, with respect to gender diversity and, and, and um, gender inclusivity? So, you know, I think that the goal for us um, was to normalize the existence and the reality of gender um, diversity, just that humans are gender diverse. That, that to me seems sort of as apolitical as possible, just to say that this is a reality. Empirically speaking, this is a reality of our species is that folks identify in a, in a diversity of ways. Um, we started with that assumption and then moved to the place of, well, because we know that's true and we know that we have a mission to support our students, here's what we're going to do. Um, but the, the point of the, our community letters that we sent out at Friends was to um, raise people's awareness, to recognize that humanity is far more complicated than perhaps they may have assumed, um, then to say our imperative as a school community hasn't changed. We are supporters of students. We are cheerleaders of students, and so we're going to continue to do that work. And then we're going to do that work more specifically around gender. Um, and then we're going to take some time to explore gender as a whole community. Um, the idea of normalizing gender diversity um, and therefore of creating a space for trans and non-binary visibility um, was a critical component. Does that help, my friend? Thank you. So I think we're at the end of our time. Thank you all so much for coming, and, a th and thank you so much to our amazing panel of Quaker School educators. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs>